On my honor, I will do my best. On my honor, I will do my best. To do my duty to God and my country. To, to God and my country. And to obey the Scout Law. And to obey the Scout Law. To help other people at all times. To help other people at all times. Wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband? To live together according to God's law in the holiest state of matrimony. Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health? And forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live. Meeting. Jennifer Tyrell was a Cub Scout Den leader in Ohio until he says the organization dismissed her for being a lesbian. And Mr. R B Vice President, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Joseph R. Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. I, Joseph R. Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. Then you're going to repeat after me. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by the law. And that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, so help me God. Congratulations. I opened with this visual and audio montage attempting to perform examples of the oath in some other way than a scrapbook or an album, and in fact more like an assemblage of various bodies defining oath-taking, even oath-breaking. In Thousand Plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari talk about the mechanic assemblage which includes oaths and their variables as part of the collective assemblage of enunciation. Deleuze and Guattari later write that a society is defined by its amalgamations, not by its tools. Concerning the oath, then, I propose looking at it not as a tool, but as a part of collectivities. In that sense, it might be easier to ask what an oath performs and what performativity emerges. For the purposes of this short presentation, I would like to look at the 1981 air traffic controller strike and the way the oath is performed by President Reagan, a strike that had the potential of downing all air traffic nationwide and costing the airline companies, as well as other businesses, millions of dollars per day. Reagan's response was to bring in military personnel with flight experience along with FAA supervisors to cover the control towers. Furthermore, Reagan delivered an abrupt ultimatum to the more than 12,000 U.S. air traffic controllers that if they wanted to keep their jobs, they would have to return to work within 48 hours or be fired. As this video shows, the President's performance was used to mobilize support to keep air travel going. What I hope we can do as we watch this video is what John McKenzie and performer else calls performance analysis which he says has an inherently political character. Let me make one thing plain. I respect the right of workers in the private sector to strike. Indeed, as president of my own union, I led the first strike ever called by that union. I guess I'm maybe the first one to ever hold this office who is a lifetime member of an AF of LCIO union. But we cannot compare labor management relations in the private sector with government. Government cannot close down the assembly line. It has to provide without interruption the protective services which are government's reason for being. It was in recognition of this that the Congress passed a law 
forbidding strikes by government employees against the public safety. Let me read the solemn oath taken by each of these employees and the sworn affidavit when they accepted their jobs. I am not participating in any strike against the government of the United States or any agency thereof, and I will not so participate while an employee of the government of the United States or any agency thereof. It is for this reason that I must tell those who fail to report for duty that this morning, they are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. End of statement. It is important to note two details about Reagan before further analysis. First, he had a terrifying fear of flying. The fear was so great that his General Electric PR figure he had in his contract that air travel would never be an option for transportation. After becoming California governor and then president, Reagan was coaxed into flying as at least part of his travels. Second, Reagan had signed a memorandum of understanding to PATCO during the 1980 election and promised to do whatever was needed to improve working conditions for air traffic controllers. PATCO, in response, was one of only three unions to support Reagan for president in 1980. Why mention these facts? Obviously, the oath's performance is more efficacious when held by the president than by the public employees union, and a fear of flying suggests there's always more to an assemblage than rational communication and understanding. Oath-taking and oath-breaking are bound to happen. The citizenship oath that was recited earlier is something few cradle citizens have listened to in full. Maybe this is why Plato cautions against oath-taking while Hobbes requires it. Plato argues that oath-taking only leads to oath-breaking and eventually swearing to tell the truth or be truthful becomes cheap. Agamben tells us that Homer's Autolycus utters oaths as verbal tricks to signify literally and figuratively opposite meanings simultaneously. Edward Frankel says that the one who holds the faith placed in her by another has this other at her mercy. McKinsey argues that cultural researchers have theorized about the efficacy of performance in terms of social justice, while organizational experts scan efficiency of performance in terms of bureaucratic economy. This difference in theoretical focus seems suited to the performativity of how Patco and Reagan contested the question of air traffic control. Patco voted in overwhelming numbers to go on strike and remain on strike even after Reagan gave his ultimatum. For Patco, the issue was a social justice cause. Reagan, on the other hand, advocated the need for strong performance in, that, in the bureaucratic economy since it would also affect the corporate economy. Reagan would eventually win, but the struggle was overshadowed by Reagan's simultaneously support for the larger general government strike in Poland. However, for Poland, neither organizational efficiency nor technological effectiveness had a prayer. But for Patco, the oath as the primary reason for firing did not compute. Patco members saw themselves as indispensable technologically, even though most had some, only some, college education and mainly military experience. But as McKinsey so correctly points out, the technological knowledge gets layered with organizational efficiency based on performances of work teams and initi initiation rituals. But what about the oath? McKinsey seems to think that Derrida is onto something with his perfume of discourse, a phrase used to describe the we, or yes. McKinsey calls this kind of performance perfumance, which is anachronistic untimely. It belongs to the future. Perfumance emits emissions of the future. Quoting Almer, McKinsey argues that perfumance is accentuated by conceptual laughter as a tonality of a future post-conceptual thought. Derrida's perfumative understands the performative enunciation because it comprehends it as the enunciation in the apocalyptic mode similar to the biblical end of the world forecast. To perform, then, is to listen by shifting from signifieds to tone, that is, 
to understand is to reconfigure one's temporality so that the past and the present do not crowd out coming attractions. It is not, as Patco did, live in the past, expecting Reagan to deliver on goods he had promised. Nor is it living in the present with a martyr's sense of the past, although there is something apocalyptic about the whole scene. If the trope in this case is an oath, I am left smelling an old performativity that only gets worked out by striking air traffic controllers. Oaths invite control, discipline, obedience, etc. And in this sense, Patco sticking with the strike and going out, as many of the members did, in bankruptcy and into a world of pain, seems, well, traumatic, but independent, and even creative. According to Agamben, Plutarch says that to swear is, first of all, to curse, and to curse oneself in the event that one says what is false or does not do what one has been promised. Clearly, Plutarch's formula is an unhappy utterance no matter how one reads it. However, the paradox of already damning oneself before being damned for perjury or failure to keep a promise makes swearing an oath more reasonable. Otherwise, how can we take an oath and be honest with ourselves? In Reagan's utilization of the affidavit, it seems obvious that the public was his target, always along with the media. I make this claim because I don't believe the oath is as critical as it will be, or would be, in a courtroom. Reading this doctored version of the oath into the record elevated the oath-breaking to a nationalistic mythic level. The lore is that before the speech, President Reagan asked to see the oath, and then he added it to the speech a speechwriter had already given him. The Speech Act made audible the fact that taking an oath is to curse oneself turning the strike into the very blasphemy Patco wanted to express without the oath. But Patco could not curse the government fast enough, lacking the proper public relations strategy, as the Union fell behind the overwhelming support for the President. For Patco, there could be no compromise, more reason for understanding that the performativity of the strike itself was meant to carry heavy illocutionary force was the strike a doubling down on a malediction against the federal government? If we work and defend the U.S. Constitution oath seriously as a performative, does it not pose serious problems that go beyond even the questions of fealty that we find in such rituals, typically religious but also military? Taking this federal oath cannot, for instance, alleviate the anxiety of believing one will be able to fulfill all the promises within it, questions of adequacy, competence, and even the will haunt the perfectionist who imagines a myriad of situations that would prevent him or her from living up to this obligation. But in this sense, isn't the oath an unhappy performative? Not surprisingly, the problem exists even if one believes he or she can live up to the oath or take seriously certain circumstances and lives up. Take, for instance, the case involving Captain Medina and Lieutenant Cowley during the Vietnam War. Medina was court-martialed in 1971 for ordering his men to kill innocent Vietnamese civilians. Eventually, Medina was acquitted with the help of legal counsel F. Lee Bailey. Coincidentally enough, Bailey was the catalyst in founding PATCO in 1968. On the other hand, Cowley was found guilty for killing 109 Malay civilians, mostly women and children, and was sentenced to life in prison. Because Cowley's defense had been that he was following the orders of his superiors per his own, was a national outrage and a mass call for his release. He was released after serving three or so years in military prison. What is significant here is that as a performative, the military oath, which is similar to the oath that the PATCO members took, adds this condition of military discipline and obedience. Quote, I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to regulations 
and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. In some sense, this part of the oath appears to free the oath-taker from acting freely. But as the Uniform Code of Military Justice implies, each soldier has an individual duty not to follow orders if they are unlawful, often referred to as the Principle of Nuremberg. It is important to note here that most of the PATCO members of 1981 were Vietnam War veterans. They had not been drafted, but had willingly enlisted in the service. Because FAA tapped the military for many of its controllers, veterans were the most likely candidates for air traffic control in the United States, explaining the militaristic atmosphere of the occupation. Returning to the oath, the question of the unhappy utterance weighed heavy on these union members. But looking at the performativity of the oath, again, it is not so clear that it is always unhappy. Many people take vows, oaths, make promises, commitments, and sign leases and mortgages, and they do this with full faith. Yet, no matter the result, there is a perfumance waiting, a future sense that a debt may not be paid, that a promise cannot be fulfilled, that a vow will be broken. Such is probably the perfumance, and the unspeakable way in which a temporal spatial shift suddenly announces itself. Mackenzie takes on this as not so happy. He sees in this kind of performativity the challenging forth of a world meant for each of us to perform or else, for all to do, not be. In his latest book, Mackenzie even points his finger at the imperialist notions of performance studies itself, its unwittingly authoritative self-image. Perhaps this is Mackenzie's performance, his enunciation. 